I'm here not only to congratulate on behalf of CC, but also to talk a bit about the changes that were brought about by CC. Um, and I'm going to start out with a little rundown of what CC is really and what it isn't. So let's. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I hope you um, get the idea and nevertheless. So what it is exactly? The waves of change, I call it, is what, what it changed in the past 10 years and uh, so what is going to come tomorrow. What is it? It's legal tools. It's very boring legal stuff usually. Legal tools that people can apply to their own individual copyright protected works and thereby in a very controlled and conscious way lower the protection level of um, copyright for these works. Why do they do this? They do it because copyright law follows a very maximalist approach. You might all know this, but as I say it um, nevertheless. Every creative expression is automatically rights protected, as Alec just said, um, against um, being used by other people without permission. That there's some exceptions in the law, but very, very limited ones. And while this is often beneficial, sometimes it's very good that everything uh, that, that works are, are protected automatically. There is uh, cases in which this is not good, in which it is not intended, not necessary, and it can even become an obstacle for new creations that come after this. For example, this one. This is a paper collage by uh, an artist called Ashanti from the UK, and it's made up of around 120 different pieces from different pre-existing works. And if you want to publish this, usually you have to clear the rights for 120 different things that you used in your collage. And of course, that's very hard to do. In some cases, you wouldn't even know who the artist is, who the rights holder is. And this kind of, um, this kind of art and this kind of creativity is severely hindered by copyright rules. That's, that's a fact. So, People might say, okay, I get it, you have to call the artists and you have to clear the rights, but why would people apply such a freedom to their own works? Because in the end, they lower the, the protection level of copyright. Um, and, and the reasons are, are different, so it's not everybody doing it for the same reasons. The works can move more freely on the net, at least that's in theory. Th that can in turn boost the reputation and you get more contacts, you get more interaction with your audience. And also you give back something to the commons and the commons is the idea that all that is, has been produced before you and is not rights protected is for you to take. And in the end, ultimately every artist is also a user of pre-existing things. So why not give something back? How is this done? Open licensing models address this copyright overprotection, as some call it, by making it easier to grant permission to everybody. And uh, this means this is done by standardized agreements um, that are easy to understand or should be easy to understand to, and to recognize. They don't require any negotiations. They don't require any communication, actually, to come into force. And that makes it, make, makes it much easier. But conditions apply. If someone wants to allow indiscriminate use of their stuff, they can just simply waive their rights, although that is not so simple in, in all countries. For example, in Germany, again, this is not possible, actually. But you can just waive it. You don't need a license. So why, need a, why do you have a license? Because some people would like to only give permission under conditions. And in contrast to just giving up your rights, you use a licensing contract, and so you lower the copyright protection gradually instead of giving it all up. And this is uh, done by, by giving this permission to everybody in those CC licenses, for example. The different permissions or the different, no, the different conditions that CC licenses are made of, I guess you probably know them all already, are four. These four symbols represent the attribution, the share-alike, non-commercial, and no derivatives. Um, I guess most of you will, will have seen these already. Attribution means you have to say whose work it is. Share alike means if you're building on this work with a new cre creativity, you have to use the same or similar license. Non-commercialist says you are only permitted to do things non-commercially and no derivatives means not very free-minded, I would say, uh, that you're not allowed to change this work. And these are called laundry symbols. That is something that 
des describes what it is meant to do, which is everybody shall easily be able to see what is allowed and what the conditions are. These format modular conditions make six different licenses. Um, I guess you, you've seen them. And these standardized agreements are easy to understand and to recognize. So when you've seen it, when you've read it once, when you see it again, you know what is happening. You, are not, you don't have to read all the text again. These are the six uh, combinations of the modules or of the conditions. Um, just uh, to recapitulate, and this, these are the laundry symbols that you see, for example, on Wikipedia, but also increasingly um, in other places. The result is to be some rights reserved, as opposed to all rights reserved. This is the mantra of CC. And so what Creative Commons is not, and this is one slide that is very dear to me, it's not an alternative copyright. This is what uh, you said before. Um, it can't be an alternative. Of course it cannot be. And it's also definitely not um, a giving up of rights, and also not a statement that says you can do whatever you want with it. Although, for the latter two, CC has also some tools in its toolbox, but this is not the CC licenses. The effect is very simple. You come from all rights reserved, this is a legal standard default case, and then you apply a CC license and you end up at some rights reserved. And if that is not enough, if you want to get rid of all your rights, you can use the CC0 waiving declaration, then you get to no rights reserved or public domain. What is the organization behind all this? It's a non-profit non incorporated company located in the US with about a dozen staff members, it goes up and down. And this is a, a curating organization. So CC is curating the texts of the licenses, but of course not the content that is licensed under these licenses. This whole operation is financed by donations, usually coming from larger foundations in the US, like Gates Foundation or Hewlett, and also from small donations, which are collected around Christmas each year. Plus, and this is the, I guess, more important part um, also today, is the global network of, uh, of volunteers organized in teams, such as CC Polska. And they are, I would call them CC's backbone, because not only in numbers are they much more than the staff members, they are also much more important, I think, because um, we want to have a worldwide impact and not some, we want, don't want to be something that's happening between the US government and the US civil society or something. So we have more than, CC, more than 80 CC affiliates, such as uh, in Poland. This, these are mostly volunteers, sometimes relying on local donations or project funding, or sometimes being employed at, uh, at universities. Um, they are usually lawyers, but not all of them. We just saw that when Justina told us about the past years of CC Poland. It's not all lawyers. It's also lawyers, but not all of them. Activists, creative people, but usually very progressive and um, forward-thinking people, I would say. And the task they have is licensed translation, provide support for local communities, helping with versioning, and also, I would say, um, driving, driving free culture and innovation in their country. So what happened over the past 10 years of CC Poland on, and about 15 years of CC? I would say the first wave, I would call it, was the enthusiasm that, that was spreading. You could see that in the lovely pictures with uh, Alec and Justina and others. Um, in a, a slightly younger age, with strange t-shirts and strange things on their heads. Um, that was around the turn of the millennium, when everybody was talking about knowledge and intellectual property being the oil of the 21st century. Um, that became popular. I don't know if it's really true, uh, but it was a very popular notion. And then the infamous copyright wars started, um, and very, in a very um, visible way, suddenly involving a lot of people that usually did not have to do anything with, with law. And this, um, this led to some kind of culture of enthusiasm to move into this area and change the world and do something about it. And this is still exciting many in the group of CC affiliates, me for example. Um, and this was the, we already talked about him, the superstar and, and CC founder. Uh, Lawrence Lessig, now trying to run for president in the US. And he is still kind of the, um, 
the holy, the holy spirit behind the whole thing. Then the second wave came, the second wave was institutions, in this case uh, private institutions um, as, such as Flickr and the Wikipedia community, which is also non-governmental of course. They were leading the way towards scaling CC, so to say. In 2005, Flickr in introduced CC licenses as an option for their, um, for their users in the back end. Many took it up, and in 2008, uh, Wikipedia moved its whole content to these two CC licenses, CC BY and CC BY SHARE and like. And this set off a whole, whole chain of, uh, of such, uh, such moves. So suddenly, not only individual people um, put their own works under, under CC licensing, but whole curating and hosting institutions put this as an option in their, in their systems. And the third wave, I would say was public institutions. They are always a bit slower. We know that that um, that's not not a bad thing. Bad thing necessarily. Sometimes it's good to be a little slower. And the public institutions, such as libraries, museums, archives, especially the heritage institutions, were the first to move um, around the, the opening up of content. Of course, because that is their is close to their heart. Um, then several governments followed, like the governments were taught by their own institutions usually, um, and, uh, and they, made, they made it in part as, as they had different efforts, of course it was not only about creative work, it was also about open data and open government practices. And then it moved even higher up to the intergovernmental level, and uh, this was kind of crowned by a specialized CC set of licenses, the CCPL 3.0 IGO port. So nowadays, even international intergovernmental organizations can use CC licenses, and this is, I think, a great achievement. And we even had change of law. We had several countries that passed laws and regulations that now include, or at least think, uh, also open licensing with it. For example, in Germany and in Russia, we have um, changes in the copyright code that removed certain formalities in order to make it possible to, to do open licensing. So that means politics have uh, understood that this is important. And we have, of course, a lot of funding rules nowadays for public, uh, publicly funded content, where you have to, in the end, publish under open access or open content principles. So what, what difference does it make? I would say, Many more people than 10 years ago are aware of copyright rules and are empowered to handle them, more or less, some more, some less, of course. The copyright debate has been broadened considerably, that's, that's for sure, that's definite. And, and much, much more content is out there and can be actually reused. For example, this is a kind of set of numbers because people always want to see numbers. This is from the State of the Commons report of last year, you can see, you, you, can, you get an idea that there is something out there, out there that you can use. It might just be 1% of all that is out there, but still it's a lot. So if you're looking for specific content that can be legally reused, you can find some, usually. Is it a new standard in copyright? Well, not, regard, not regarding the more sane level of copyright protection, because all rights reserved is still the default, so it still rules in a way, and so you're right. One percent might be uh, might be a lot or not, depending on the standpoint. But the way that CC's ideas were taken up, or that Larry Lessig's ideas were taken up, and have scaled across various communities, um, that has put legal <coughs> legal sharing on the map. It doesn't mean that sharing didn't happen before that, but legal sharing is on the map definitely now. And it has changed the thinking, I would say. All of us here in the room, I guess, have a different idea now today what sharing and what, what, um, what legal tools are out there um, than, than before Creative Commons came along. <coughs> and very importantly, especially for content industries, the sky didn't fall. So CC came about, CC was introduced in various places and um, the, the word has not ended and creativity has not ended, and uh, business models have not ended. Open by default is gaining ground. This is something I'm very proud of, and I think it's very good to see. So CC, both as the organization and also as the affiliate community, have put licensing policy on the map in practical ways, which means 
For example, we have built the Open Policy Network, which is a new structure to foster open policies. And we have built arguments and toolkits, I'm going to come to that in the end, to persuade governments and publicly funded resources should be default, should by default be open. And this is actually getting traction now in Europe, in, in the US, in Asia, in several places. And okay, CC didn't invent sharing, this is for sure, so that's, as I said before, sharing happens, uh, sharing in the, in, in the sense of giving works to others and copying it around, it happens without CC, but a lot of sharing um, is now done with a different feeling. So um, as far as copyright is in the way of sharing, CC points, CC is a reference point that it, could, it can be done legally without breaking the law.